I'm Jose Antonio Carrillo de la Plata. I'm professor of the analysis of nonlinear partial differential equations at the University of Oxford. And we are here at Queen's College where I usually meet my students and I do research in this area. I'm going to explain to you several uh, uh, examples of uh, partial differential equations and I will try to convey the use of uh, these tools in the uh, uh, sciences, in uh, particular in physics and engineering and in life sciences where they find lots of applications. A differential equation is just a mathematical way in which we can write the relation between different magnitudes. The basic differential equation that we can say is uh, position divided by time equals velocity. But uh, normally we write it in uh, mathematics in a continuous way. We assume that we have a path followed by a particle, which is a continuous movement, let's say, along this path in time. And we call that the position at each time of the particle. And then to write the uh, continuous version of it, we just say that the rate of change in time of the position is equal to the velocity. In order to write that in a precise way, we say the derivative of x with respect to time equals to velocity. Here we are assuming that the velocity is given, but most likely is not known. For instance, the movement of each of the particles in the air filling this room is very complicated. And it can be uh, very, uh, very complicated even if, uh, for instance, we are outside in the atmosphere. But anyhow, we can talk about that as a differential equation. And then the second law of Newton in the Principia Mathematica told us a long time ago that mass times acceleration is equal to the forces acting on the particle. And that we can write again as a mathematical law. We can write that the second derivative in time of the position is equal to the forces acting on the particle. Or if you want the derivative of the velocity in time is equal to the forces acting on the particle. That's the way in which we can write mathematically second new, uh, second, uh, the second law of Newton in the Principia Mathematica. A partial differential equation is just an advanced tool uh, related to a differential equation that allows me to write now an evolution for an ensemble of particles. So let's assume that we want to follow the movement of all the particles that are filling the air in this room. There are plenty of them. And we know by the Avogadro number that there will be of order of 10 to the 23 particles filling, molecules filling the air in this room. So we cannot talk about the movement of each single molecule that is filling this room because it will be hugely complicated. However, we can follow the density of particles in this room. Then we define a magnitude, which is the density, at this position x in this room and at, at each time t, that gives me the density of particles in the room or if you want the density of air in this room. Then we can talk about the evolution of that density. That it will, was, uh, is what a partial differential equation will give you. These kind of equations are typical in continuum mechanics, and we talk about continuous media because we follow continuously the, the density of that uh, uh, set of particles. And I will show you some examples of partial differential equations later on my computer. Uh, some examples will be more historic to, uh, because they have been important for development of the theory of uh, this field and others because of the practical implications that they have. And uh, they are the basic tools, the basic laws, in which we can write all kind of uh, mathematical laws used in physics, in engineering, in biology, in the life sciences. And lately, they are encountering more and more applications in data science to develop uh, methods to solve problems of optimization, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many others. So, this is the Math Institute of the University of Oxford. Welcome, I'm going to show you my office. As you can see, it's a fantastic building, uh, very beautiful. It looks very much like, uh, well, almost like a Harry Potter movie, no? The moving uh, stairs. Okay, please come in. Let me then explain to you what a, is a basic partial differential equation. Let me start with differential equations. Probably the most well-known example of a differential equation comes from Newton's second law, uh, written in the Principia Mathematica centuries ago. 
So what it says the Newton's law? So it says that if you know the forces acting on a particle, you can write the movement of that particle by writing the relation that m times the acceleration is equal to the forces acting on the particle. So this means that if I have a path which uh, I start from some location x naught, and this particle suggests to those forces, I know the movement at each time of that particle that I denote by x of t, finding the solution of this differential equation. Why this is an equation? Because at this x dot dot, what it means is the second derivative. This means the second derivative of x with respect to time. So the rate of change of the velocity in time, which is the acceleration, times the constant, uh, which is given by the mass, is equal to the forces. By finding the location x of t, we are solving the differential equation and then finding the movement of the particles. Let me give you an example using numerical simulations of differential and partial differential equations. Uh, this is an example of a system of differential equations in which we are following the position and the velocity of a system of n particles, which are interacting through uh, these uh, different uh, parameters and potentials. And they resemble Newton's like equation in the sense that uh, they are based on giving you the acceleration of each of the particles. So uh, this is a model that appears in collective behavior of individuals in which uh, you want to obtain what is called the long time asymptotics of the system of particles, so meaning the behavior when uh, time goes on of the system. And here I'm going to give you two examples of uh, the, the behavior that you can expect. So here the arrows are the velocities of the particles, the little circles here are the positions of the particles, and you will see very quickly in this simulation here that the particles will arrive to a consensus in velocity, meaning that the velocity of all the particles, the arrows, becomes the same, and they are just then moving translationally in this direction. You don't see the movement of the particles because uh, we center the simulation on the center of the particles, on the center of mass of the particles, so then you don't see really the real movement that is indicated by the arrows. Here in the simulation, uh, it seems that uh, all the time that I've been talking, there is no any kind of uh, order of, uh, or some kind of uh, typical behavior. It seems that uh, they are just moving randomly around that location, like, um, I don't know, like, uh, like uh, flies around certain location. But you will see that after a while, some behavior appears and uh, a kind of rotating behavior along, uh, around certain center point uh, becomes dominant and you get this kind of behavior that we usually refer as the milling profile. So, in general, in differential equations, in system of differential equations, we are interested in explaining some of these behaviors and the generic behaviors that are stable, that, appears, uh, that appear naturally in the evolution of the system. Let me then show you another example of what is a partial differential equation. As I said before, I'm going to show you an example of uh, what is a partial differential equation and what is the use of them by numerical simulations. Here I have a system of uh, partial differential equations which comes from mathematical biology in which u and v represents a density of cells. Let's say u is the one that here is pigmented in red, v is the one that is pigmented in uh, green. And um, here I'm going to show you an experiment of what is called differential addition. You see the size of the arrows here, they represent how as strong are the forces between the different type of cells. Here essentially the reds and the greens they attract each other and between themselves with the same strength while here the red and the, and the green uh, they are attracting strongly than between themselves. So this leads to different behavior when the cells meet because of the different proteins that they uh, produce and the different forces by addition that uh, they assert onto each other. And here you have an experiment done in the lab with these uh, different uh, cells, that they have these different uh, cell addi addition forces. And here you have our model based on those partial differential equations. And then you see the evolution and when they meet, uh, they, uh, you see in this case that they produce a perfect uh, kind of propagation front or a front in between uh, the two species, while here they have an area of mixing that uh, in which uh, the reds and the green are somehow intermingling between each other. And the uh, model somehow is recovering that size, the size of that intermingling zone. These differential addition forces can lead to different behavior when uh, time goes on, as you can see in these simulations, 
in which you see that depending on the uh, different addition forces between the two, then you recover either the mixing between the two species or somehow the one species surrounds the other at a certain extent, uh, or even partially, like in this case, or they are totally segregated. So this is just an example that I hope uh, you have enjoyed and you have learned now what is about the research in differential and partial differential equations. Thank you for listening. to thank the Spanish Embassy for giving me the opportunity to give you this talk. Today I'm going to give you a brief overview about vaccine development against malaria and also I will briefly talk about our latest results at the Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, I am David Pulido Gomez. So let's start talking about malaria. So malaria is a human disease this transmitted by the bite of the female Anopheles mosquito. Uh, this disease is caused by the intracellular plasmodium parasites of more than 120 plasmodium species. Only five, those that show here in the table on the right, are known to infect humans. Of these different species, the deadliest of them all is plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum has a complex life cycle. It has two hosts, the mosquito and also the human. And in the human it has two different stages, the liver stage and the blood stage. So during the blood meal, the mosquito inoculates sporozoids that infect hepatocytes, liver cells, then the parasites and the ghost of the peritocytic liver stage where it replicates and this lasts uh, between one to two weeks and then releases merozoids into the blood stage. Then into the blood, sorry. So then you start the blood stage. During the, the blood stage, the merozoids infect the red blood cells. And then there is the asexual cycle where they replicate and a subpopulation of those can transform or switch into the sexual development, forming or producing gametocytes. Then the mosquito, again during the blood meal, uptakes these uh, gametocytes and they can fuse, the female and the male, they can fuse, forming a zygote. And then this zygote transforms into an orchinate, abandoning the midgut of the mosquito. And there, um, oocyst produces sporozoids that migrate to the salivary glands. And then the mosquito can infect again humans releasing the sporozoids and the cycle starts over again. Regarding the distribution or the global distribution of malaria, this disease is found in 91 countries worldwide. Here I show a map where you can see the annual global incidence. Darker color means higher presence of the malaria disease and lighter colors uh, implies less of an incident. As you can see, malaria is widespread in the equator from America to Asia. In 2018, the World Health Organization reported an estimated of 228 million cases of malaria just in that, in that year of which 213 and 93% occurred in Africa. Globally, every year is estimated to be more than 400,000 deaths. 85% of those deaths occurred in Africa and India. <coughs> Sadly, 67% uh, of those deaths are estimated to be in children under the age of five. Malaria <coughs> kills a child 
and the age of five every two minutes. Among the other people that are at risk of severe malaria are pregnant women, immunocompromised patients, and travelers. Despite all of this, International um, researchers, institutions, organizations, governments, and pharmaceutical companies are working hard trying to tackle this disease and eliminate and eradicate malaria. And if so, then the graphs I show you here from 2000 until 2015, both cases, as I show in the left, they're decreasing over time as well as deaths. However, if we want to eradicate, completely eliminate this disease within the 21st century, novel strategies will be required. And if so, the scientific community are developing novel technologies to tackle this disease. These promising novel technologies that are emerging include uh, new diagnostics and medicines, especially those um, trying to tackle um, the resistance of the parasite, as well as vector control, new insecticides and chemicals um, to, for, for the nets or, or for spraying walls in, in houses, <clears throat> as well as passive immunization therapies such as monoclonal antibodies. Last but not least, there are vaccines, and the international community agrees that the development of a highly effective and durable vaccine would be key in the elimination and eradication of the disease. But what about vaccines on malaria? To date, only one malaria vaccine has been successfully developed. This one is RTSS. In 2015, RTSS with the adjuvant AS01 vaccine was approved by the European Medicine Agency for the prevention of Plasmodium falciparum in young children. This vaccine is a virus-like particle-based um, vaccine where the circumsporozoid protein is fused to the hepatitis B surface antigen. You have the circumsporozoid protein and the hepatitis B that forms a virus-like particle. Results from the phase 3 trials in Africa show that three doses given over 18 months provided a 46% protection from clinical malaria in children aged 5 to 17 months, with a fourth uh, booster dose given at 20 months providing 36% protection over 4 years. This vaccine exhibits moderate to low efficacy, partly due to the high antigenic variation. So if we really want to eradicate malaria, we'll have to improve our current vaccines and the Malaria Vaccine Technology Roadmap to 2030 calls to develop a next generation of vaccines to achieve 75% efficacy or more over two years against Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax. So we need to develop novel vaccines and the international community has not been idle about this subject. So lots uh, of different research have been developed over the last 20 years developing novel vaccines that target the different stages of the cycle of Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax. I would like to give you an overview of the different vaccines that they are currently in clinical trials have been tested in humans. Um, so here I show um, a list of them that they tackle different stages and I will explain them briefly in a second. So the first one of these strategies is similar to the vaccine RTSS that I just explained. They uh, inhibit the sporozoids to infect the hepatocytes in the liver. Another strategy to develop vaccines mediate T cells in order to kill the infected hepatocytes. And you have these different vaccines that they aim to do that. Another strategy um, in the blood stage, 
they elicit antibodies that they block the merozoid, the parasite, to uh, infect or enter the red blood cells, preventing the malaria clinical symptoms. Other type of malarias, they're targeted um, to the parasite infected red blood cells. And then, finally, we have malaria vaccines aimed to the mosquito stages, aiming to block the transmission of the parasites from the mosquito back into humans. I would like to briefly talk today about our efforts at the Jenna Institute in generating novel blood stage vaccines. These aim to reduce the sexual replication rate and hence protecting the vaccine against the severe disease. For more than 20 years, it's been very difficult to find a vaccine in the blood stage to block the merozoid here on the left to infect the erythrocyte. And that has been proven a challenge because there are many different proteins at the surface of the merozoid that interact with receptors in the erythrocyte. On top of this complexity, another difficulty is that these different proteins are highly polymorphic and also they are redundant. If you tackle one, the parasite is able to use another one to infect the red blood cell. And it was until 2011 that the first highly conserved target was discovered. And this one was susceptible to vaccine-induced proline-neutralizing polyclonal antibodies. And this antigen is Rh5. Rh5 molecule on the parasite interact with the pathogen receptor, also known as CD147, at the surface of the erythrocyte. Average 5 protection um, based vaccine, sorry, <coughs> has been shown in animal models. Average 5 vaccines are able to protect mouse, rats, rabbit, rabbits, and non human primates. For the first time, in a blood stage vaccine has shown in the first in human Average 5 clinical trial a significant delay of the disease. This is great news. But however, we need to continue improving the current vaccine. In 2014, it was reported the um, average 5 bound to pathogen um, structure and also neutralizing maps that reveal where the protective epitopes were, and by precision immunology, we could um, modify the antigen making it um, focusing towards these protective epitopes. Also, thermostabilization, uh, introducing point mutations, performed a thermostable molecule, making it a better vaccine. Also, we have engineered this thermostable Rh5 molecule to conjugate it onto a hepatitis B surface antigen, forming a virus-like particle similar to the RTSS vaccine. Our Rh5 virus-like particle-based vaccine has shown uh, an improve of 5 to 10-fold in animal models. And we're producing this vaccine to GMP standards and planning to evaluate the Rh5 VLP-based vaccine in the clinic next year. I would like to thank all the members of the group, past and present, as well as our collaborators, our funders, and thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. I'm Afonso Jaramillo. I'm a professor at the University of Warwick, and I work on synthetic biology. Uh, the University of Warwick is located in the center in, in, of the UK, very close to uh, the birthplace of uh, Shakespeare, and it's uh, ranked uh, among the, the top uh, UK universities. So uh, the goal of our lab is to design 
some smart biological molecules to be used in a therapy to cure diseases. Okay, so, so we want to create a new generation of in this therapeutics that are able to differentiate between one target and the other, and then very specifically, okay? So if we can have this single cell specificity, they will be able to not only kill antibiotic resistant bacteria, but also parasites that like the plasmodium of uh, producing in the in malaria disease, which is killing most people in the world. And uh, we could also use it even to produce an, a, an, an antimicrobials that can just target cancer cells and not normal uh, uh, cells. Okay, so what you will avoid any in secondary effects. Or even you could just uh, target senescent cells. These are cells that are uh, aging and are older than other cells. And then that makes a whole tissue older. If you kill those, then the newborns in occupy their place and then the average age decreases. Okay? So then uh, there is a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, applications if we are able to design an, an, an antimicrobial that is able to kill very specific cells, organism specific and, and antimicrobial. So, but then how are uh, and we doing that? We are doing that by using an automation of this design. So normally this, uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, the name automation is used with computers and uh, also with robots. And then uh, you, people may get the misled that our automation is just uh, uh, using the computer to help us to design. Like uh, you can use computers to help to design a car or to design uh, in some other things. Or you use a word processor to help you to write a manuscript. So then all this formatting is done automatically by the word processor. It's helping you, yes. This is not with what we do. The equivalent would be that you tell the computer and to your word processor, please write me a, a, a book or manuscript about some, a, 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 some subject and I'll go to the beach and then you do it for me. That automation of the creativity is what we are aiming for, okay? So for that, we have to simulate on the computer all the a, a, a loss of physics for the molecules and also how evolution works because we use the same type of in methodology that nature uses to, uh, to produce complex matter like us, living organisms, and uh, to use it to produce our uh, in, uh, multifunctional smart molecules. Therefore, and, uh, this is the key thing, this automation of the design. But this is done only when we have uh, small molecules uh, like proteins and, uh, uh, and, uh, or single nucleic acids or uh, mixtures of them. And we have uh, published that uh, throughout uh, the years. But uh, now we are aiming even bigger. We are want to have these organism specific and antimicrobials. We want to specifically kill cells. So for that, we need complexes, uh, uh, assemblies of uh, proteins that makes a very complicated machinery, okay? This is far beyond our knowledge on, on the physics, how to model the physics of that. Therefore, what we do is we use bioreactors with living cells and we express those in, in, in molecules inside the cell. And then we act we use the same type of algorithm to accelerate the evolution we use in the computer, but experimentally. Therefore, when instead of in using in some in, in a random number generator, we increase the mutation rate and with some chemical, etc. Okay, so it, that's how in a, we do in the lab. They are mimic of what the software does with this in, a, in optimization of the 
in design. And we test, uh, of course, all our uh, in, uh, systems, either we do by direct evolution or in ex experimental uh, evolution, or we do it in the computer. And we test it with bi in bioreactors, micro bioreactors. Uh, why micro? Because we want to see single cells. As you can see here, this is our in bacteria. You could see uh, at the beginning how they were just in, uh, in replicating. And this is of the size of one square meter, and uh, sorry, one in a, in, a in a square centimeter. Okay, so this is the, the size of a coin, and you have uh, are more than two hundred in a chambers like this one, where you can have in all in the a monolayer of bacteria just growing, and you can all of them focus and all of maintain the focus uh, because it's an automated microscope and then you can just monitor the gene expression by using fluorescent reporters okay so that's very important in order to know carefully how uh, in our in uh, systems behave our uh, multifunctional molecules and then we also as i said we also aim to uh, make these antimicrobials as assembly of uh, of uh, proteins and this is and a, a very useful to I mean, kill specific uh, in cells. So we, uh, uh, what uh, we have done is to create a strategy where from the in, in genome sequence of the cell we want to kill, we can know uh, all the molecules that are around the, in this uh, in, uh, pathogen. And then we don't need to culture the pathogen, we can and use our methodology in order to create the antimicrobial that is going to kill the, the pathogen. Okay. And we create a cocktail, the same way that the uh, cocktails uh, of, uh, of antimicrobials are used in against viruses like HIV, and, but uh, in our case, it's against this pathogen to avoid the emergence of resistance due to mutations because uh, uh, nature finds always uh, their way, so we need to counteract that and minimize that. It doesn't mean that we are going to de uh, and kill forever uh, uh, the resistance, we are going to minimize it uh, and, uh, quite a lot. So, and, uh, and then, so this complex of macromolecules, what we do is we take advantage of some complexes that, of macromolecules that are already available in nature that are the viruses. But these are viruses that only attack harmless bacteria. So we use that to evolve it in our own bioreactor. So you can see this, uh, uh, the pumps we have 3D printed and design ourselves, and uh, also the, the valves. These are all in a, we, we use a, in a, all these uh, cut tools uh, for uh, 3D printing. And also we have, in a, in a, we made a farm of bioreactors so we can, in a, evolve in parallel all the uh, all the bacteria okay but very importantly once we have finished this evolution then we remove all the things from the uh, in this virus and they, uh, we only get the proteins and then are those that we use to kill so the, this is just a vehicle uh, in order to uh, evolve faster because viruses are the faster evolving entities on earth okay so then and uh, finally, we are also in aiming to create even more complex systems, more sm smarter molecules, but these are smarter cells. Can we make bacteria to be a little bit more intelligent? How uh, much intelligent? Imagine that we can make bacteria able to play board games. So that's exactly what we have done. We are in, in engineering in Esterichia coli, this is a commensal bacteria we have in our body, uh, to be able to learn by themselves to play th uh, uh, tricks. They can learn uh, many things, uh, in, even the alphabet, or they can learn to play tic-tac-toe. Okay? And uh, importantly, they use the same mechanism that our brain to learn, reinforcement learning. So this is done by you, once you can penalize and punish the cells with antibiotic each time they have lost the game. But you don't tell what was the wrong thing. It can be any of the moves that led to a, a, a lose a, a, the game. Okay? And that is the key of a reinforcement learning. Okay? So then, then they have 
they figure out, okay, and then what, how we do that? We do that by mimicking neural networks, but with genetics and in bacteria. So let me just thank uh, in, uh, all my group uh, you, uh, you, see, uh, you see here, and especially all of you for your attention. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rocio Martinez Nunez, and I'm a principal investigator in the Department of Infectious Diseases at King's College London. And what I'm going to present to you is part of the work that I've been doing to increase diagnostics capacity in the UK and Spain. So our objective was to increase diagnostics. And our labs, before the pandemic hit, looked a little bit like this picture. We have plenty of reagents and plenty of equipment. However, what we found ourselves in, during the pandemic was a little bit like what happened in supermarkets. We did not have enough reagents, we did not have enough equipment, and therefore it was impossible to cope with the demand for tests. Therefore, we needed a solution that was fast and something that allowed us to increase diagnostic capacity. We needed something that was available immediately, that was cost-effective, that was universal, so that many labs could use it. So how do we increase diagnostics capacity using automatization and also creating new protocols for detection of SARS-CoV-2? With regards to robotics, we needed something that was available then, that we could afford, and also that was uh, flexible and, and usable by different users. And this is why we opted to go for uh, a company called OpenTrons because these robots are open software and hardware and therefore are customizable to the needs of every single lab. And also because they do not require a set protocol, the user programs them to, to do the protocols that are ongoing in the lab and therefore they would be used by many different uh, labs. The timeline, the calendar that I've been showing is actually the timeline that it took us to bring the first four systems in Spain. So we started a group to uh, basically gather our expertise and time uh, on the 17th of March. And in April the 3rd is when the first four installations landed in Madrid to go two to Barcelona and two to stay in Madrid. And the keys to this was coordination and compartmentalization of the, the task. We had an, uh, an incredible team uh, we had really, really good communication and each one of us took a task. We had to coordinate between different countries. The company is based in New York, I'm based in the UK, the rest of the team is based in Spain and the robots are made in China. We had uh, a lot of communication between us and every time there was a problem, we simply saw it as an issue as to how to solve it rather than a wall that we couldn't climb. So this led to the first four installations to be set in uh, on the uh, 3rd of April. And given the, the repercussions of these robots, uh, we, we ended up bringing another 14 installations that are now uh, in, every, in, in many, many places all around Spain. And this results in around 1 million tests per month extra. With regards to the new pipelines, we have been developing this in Killset Partners, which is an academic health sciences center, and encompasses St. Thomas's Hospital, um, uh, King's College Hospital, as well as Guy's Hospital and infectious diseases. And what we did was essentially create a new lab called the June Almeida Lab in honor of the first virolo virology that discovered coronavirus. Um, and she was actually employed in, in St. Thomas's Hospital. So here you see a very simplified uh, flowchart of how COV-2 is diagnosed. We first always need to inactivate the virus because the samples are potentially infectious. 
we then need to extract the mater genetic material of the virus, which we then need to detect. So what we have been developing in the June Almeda lab is protocols of heat inactivation. Uh, we have been using a mix, mix and match approach, which allows us to mix different reagents that we usually use in molecular biology experiments rather than in clinical diagnostics, validate them through NHS England, and also we have been uh, incorporating a tracing app for our samples thanks to a collaboration with Professor Gerald in the University of Malaga. And what this allows us is to provide multiple solutions precisely to avoid running out of reagents. If we are able to use multiple reagents and multiple companies with the same efficiency, this allows us to have multiple pipelines and build resilience. So in here, I wanted to show you some of our results. And in the first uh, top two, what you see is the detection of a virus using two different primer probes. And what you see is that different methods of extraction do not change and do not modify the result. The CT values, which is what we use to detect um, um, the viral material, uh, are the same. And this is independent uh, of the uh, RT-PCR um, reagent. In, in the upper case, you see fast virus, and in the lower case, we use Luna. And the, the detection was uh, similar amongst the samples. We also use different uh, one step QPCR master mixes from the three different companies. And what you see here is a graph uh, where we assessed multiple donors. And as you see, the, the values of the PCRs did not change uh, when using one master mix or another. The other thing that we wanted to investigate was if the primer probes combinations, the reagents we use to actually detect the virus, are equally efficient. And our first experiments told us that if we could uh, use either the uh, probes for the engine or RDRP, uh, were equally uh, efficient. However, when we started using samples that had much lower viral loads, which means higher CTs, because you need to amplify more to be able to see it, what we saw is that the red dots, the RDRP gene, disappeared. So actually, it was the detection of N that allowed us to see samples that have very low viral loads, and we also assessed how heat um, could interfere with this process, and we saw that there was no variation in our qPCR results. We also investigated if other kits could observe the same, and in here you have some results where you see in blue the detection of N, and in green the detection of ORF1B, and actually for previously classified negative samples, the detection of N allowed us to be able to see virus where other uh, platforms uh, uh, had deemed those samples negative. And in here, I just wanted to show you this graph because it really shows that detecting N using different reagents um, is very, very comparable. So it's not a question of the N reagents that we were using. Using different reagents renders the same result. And also we use different plate formats. And this is really important because usually in clinical diagnostics, we use 96 well formats, but in the lab, what we are using is 384 well plates, which allows us to assess 384 samples at the same time, saving a lot of time and reagents uh, for pair extraction. The next thing that we need to understand is if these samples that have very low viral loads that we are able to detect with N are still infectious. And the last thing that I wanted to show you was that we have incorporated in our protocols heat inactivation, which we have seen, as you see on the left graph, that, that uh, warming up samples at 70 degrees for half an hour, that does not modify the results of the PCRs. And on the right um, uh, graph, you see very similar data using both uh, positive and negative samples. So this is really important because this allows essentially to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 in labs that do not have CAT3 facilities and essentially uh, allows us to expand diagnostics in many, many different settings. So at the moment in the June Almeida lab, what we are doing is develop new protocols using our home, home brew and homemade reagents. We are also evaluating saliva for testing uh, because it's a much easier material 
to use than, uh, yeah, and avoids uh, the nasopharyngeal swabs. And we are also working on new novel methodologies, including uh, LAMP, uh, including LAMPOR. Uh, we are also developing new inactivation protocols, always having in mind cost effectiveness and, and universality of use. And we are also investigating multiplexing because we are now uh, getting into the autumn and this will require us being able to distinguish different respiratory infections, which we think is now essential uh, to be able to, to control uh, the pandemic. And uh, at last, from King's Health Partners, what we want to do is contribute to mass testing in the UK. Uh, at last but not least, I wanted to leave my slide of acknowledgements. I have a lot of people to thank. Um, every person here is a volunteer in these projects. And I would like to thank uh, everyone in King's College London and King's Health Partners to, for making such an amazing team. And in Spain, uh, everyone that has put their heart and soul uh, on this project uh, to install robots. Thank you very much. <laughs>